All right, on today's show, we've got Jeff Ma. He is the host of the Bet the Process podcast, an entrepreneur, former ESPN predictive analytics expert. Uh, Jeff, how many other things could we toss on this thing for you? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I have done a lot of different things in my life, which I think means that I haven't been able to be good at any of them. So I've switched to a variety of different things throughout my career. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had the fortune to do some pretty fun things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now tell me this before we start. So I told you that I want to make our viewers smarter gamblers, smarter betters. Not everybody can go through and do the, um, what's, what's the right word? They can't do all the analytics, right? Not everybody has that capability. What, if you're building your own basic model? Where would you come in and and tell them to look? Like, what stats would you tell them to look at before you before you look at anything else? I mean, I think it depends what sport you're talking about, but I think the general principle is to, in analytics generally, is to start with data. So you want to start and see if there's a way to get first an, an, an advantage, a data advantage, right? Is there data that you can find or collect or... Um, you know, aggregate or buy that nobody else has, right? So in some sports, that can literally mean watching games and charting what happens and trying to create a data set that no one has. I think that's probably in many ways the best way to gain an advantage right now is to gain sort of a data advantage. Once you get that data, the the actual process of building a model is all about trying to find a way to predict the outcome of games um, that isn't reflected in the market already. So you start with data and you take, um, you know, whatever sort of prediction algorithm that you want to put on top of it, um, and you use that to sort of have a better way of predicting what's going to happen in a game uh, better than the market can. Gotcha. So basically, knowing what you're betting on is probably your best bet, right? Um, I mean, I'll, you have to inherently know something about the sport, right? But, I mean, there's a lot of people that will um, build models out in sports that they aren't necessarily experts are, but they do talk to subject matter experts about it. Okay, okay. Now, I, I do want to go ahead and get into a little bit of talk about you. And I know that we don't have you for long, um, but Chris has been... Well, we don't... I, I don't want to I don't want to get it too much into into <laughs> your personal stuff, I guess. I was very curious about how you met Rufus and when you got started in the sports betting. But if you're in a crunch, I'd rather ask you about some other things, if, if you don't mind. Um, do you ever, ever let your fandom affect anything about the way you bet? So, like, I, I am a complete fan, okay? I, I am not an analytic guy, and, and, and I just... Go on. I'm I'm very much Joe Public, probably. Um, now I, I'm football smart, whatever. But I have rules that I just won't bet against my team. I don't care if the line says this is the right play. It's the best play. If the you know the Patriots are the wrong play and the other the Washington is the right play, do you make that bet just because that's your model, or do you say no? I'm I'm just not doing that today. I mean, it, it depends, like, what my goal of making that bet is. You know, I, I try to believe that I'm an advantage player. Um, I, that was what I was in blackjack meeting. Every bet I make, I have an advantage in. Um, in sports betting, I'd like to think it's the same way. Now, there are times when I'll watch a game, and it's just be fun to have, it'll just be fun to have something on the game, and that's a completely different sort of motivation than why I would normally bet. But certainly – Throughout the time that I've bet on sports, there's been moments where I've bet on a team, you know, simply because I want to see them win and I want to have some emotional investment in them winning. But, no, that does not make up the lion's share of um, any betting that I do. I, I appreciate that being a fan that you at least are not a robot. <laughs> well, I mean, I was a fan first, right? I mean, I grew up as a kid being a huge sports fan. And, obviously, like, my fandom often will – you know, Trump, any bet I make, you know, I'm a, I grew up in Boston. I'm a big Red Sox Patriots, you know, and, and, and honestly, like the betting stuff, the way that we do it and the way that, you know, you mentioned Rufus, the way that Rufus does it, it's purely transactional, but there are moments in fandom that transcend, you know, the money that you would win from betting because we care about sports in ways that we care about nothing else in our lives. 
Man, that makes me feel so much better about all of this. I really do. <laughs> so my other question about, about betting is, is I watch line movement a lot. Now, I know last year you guys got into Twitter, you and Rufus, against uh, uh, SVP and, and some other people talking about that they like when, um, like, I guess 80 or 90% of the people are going one way. They want to go with the house. They feel that. Do you pay attention to line movement at all? Are you just strictly, this is the number, this is my model, that's it? Or or if line movement is moving massively one way or another, does that change your model or change the way you feel about the game? It doesn't change my model. Like, there are some people that regress to the market, like Rufus will. Like, in other words, if the, if the actually, I mean, everyone does. Like, we do to some degree regress to the market. So, yeah, so if the market does move, um, but I think, you know, you're, you're referencing an article, uh, an argument that I got into, and it, my argument was not as much with SVP as it was with Kevin Sheehan. Um, I, I still do appearances on the Tony Kornheiser show. That's where I found and you. Kevin, and that's where I, yeah, I love Kevin's Kelly. on that show also. And he kind of like has this whole, and, and SVP also has this notion of, you know, the system that they have where they believe that they want to bet against the public. And, you know, this is a very popular narrative that people have. But the problem is that nobody really knows what the public side is. I mean, you can probably sniff it out and, you know, 70% of the times they're right. But those 30% that they're wrong, is, it, it, that, those are the difference between having a winning bet and a winning system and a losing system. You know, I think the narrative is the same as any other narrative. Like, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, and it's pretty hard to systematize it in a way that you can be right um, in, in a way that gives you an advantage over the market. Uh, I think it's just a very popular narrative to talk about. And, you know, I wanted to challenge Kevin, you know, in the notion that it's such an easy system to use to beat the market. Cause it's, it's not, there isn't one way to do it. And, and those bet percentages, you know, a, a lot of times they're not coming from very reliable sources um, and they often don't really mean a lot. And, and that's going to become even more, it's even become more useless as, you know, sports betting, legal sports betting penetrates um, the United States. That makes me feel better because I use a lot of those horses and those things have swayed me in like, I'll either be stronger on the game than I originally was or whatever. I did not, I did not know that those were useless and I just kind of took them as gospel, but. Well, and some of them, I, it, a lot now are just out there and they can only base it on like one source, right? I mean, there's so many sports books, you can't get a good feel for the way that all of the public is running, right? Like, right. I, so that's that's the main thing is there's no real set way to get all of that data from every state that is now legal. So just using one of them shouldn't necessarily sway your vote because of, you know, the way that one thing is, is moving. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good way to, to talk about it. Like the the the, the source of that data um, is not always so easy to to know, you know, to validate. Now, I guess it, it in some cases it's good for uh, just basically novelty data, right? Not anything to sway. It's, it's, just, it's, enter, it's entertainment. It's, that's, it's yes. entertaining. It's like anything else. Like a lot of the struggle right now in the sports betting industry. It's figuring out what good content is, and you know it, it's hard to to piece together good content in this industry because it's such a mess. It's, I, I'm curious to talk to you about the uh, the Dumbo stuff that has been going on. Um, <laughs> the we are vehemently against selling picks because we don't believe that there is any any possible way to. To, to guarantee that anybody would be able to get their return on that, right? Because really, you're, you may be uh, educated in your data and everything, but at the end of the day, you can't guarantee that anybody's going to get their money back, and we would feel terrible, especially this year. Our, our first few weeks have been not great. But that's, that's the one thing is it, there is no set way to consistently beat the system at a at a 60 70 percent rate right no i mean 60 to 70 percent is sort of an absurd number and and you know that the, the idea the this whole thing that you're referencing is is this one health service that's kind of come out 
And, you know, they've made a lot of splash around being different and having data scientists sort of help them with their numbers and whatnot. Um, and a lot of the issue that, that we have with them is not whether their data scientists can beat the market in, you know, certain markets and things like that. It's about whether they can actually deliver long-term value to the people that buy their services. And I, I feel very confident in saying that they can't. And there's lots of reasons why they can, unfortunately, some of which have nothing to do with whether their data scientists are able to beat the market long term. Um, so, again, like the, the issue is not really around, you know, what they're doing from a modeling standpoint. It's more what they're doing from a business model standpoint and their ability to actually, you know, give value to their to their um, to their subscribers. Well, because it, so the reason I bring it up is if you were to create a system like that, once those plays are released to anybody that actually subscribes to that service, then the line value is gone almost immediately. It, like, I, I don't think I'm mistaking that, but it, maybe you can correct me on that. Like, it, once they would release those plays and everybody goes out, because I don't think that this is just a regional thing, uh, once they go out and, and hit their books, the line shifts. So everything changes from what they originally released it as. Yeah, they're really providing value to their um, subscribers. In other words, they are able to beat the market. Um, the market will adjust prices so quickly that unless you're the first one to get that email, or even if it's, they're that good, some of the books will just subscribe themselves. So it's just a really hard business model to sort of, you know, it's really hard to actually drive, to deliver any real value. Now, what I'm curious about, when when do you normally make plays? Do you immediately sit down on Sunday afternoon whenever Circa or whoever else uh, releases their lines? Do you immediately? I mean, it, just, it depends on the sport. I mean, there's always a balance, right, because the limits are going to be lower earlier in the week and they get bigger later in the week. But theoretically, the market gets smarter later in the week and there's not as many opportunities. So it's just a balance between the two. Okay. All right. Well, Jeff, we appreciate it. Um, we don't want to keep you too long. I uh, thank you for your time. I, I did hear about you and find out about you on the Tony Kornheiser show. Um, if if I had one personal question, would be I, I would like to hear the story about how you met Tony. If you if you wanted to give that, because I've heard <laughs> Tony's version of it, and I know how memory works, and I love to hear two yeah. different people's sides. No, I mean he's, the, same he's story. got it pretty nailed. He's got it pretty nailed. I mean, what happened is. Um, I was out in uh, for the Super Bowl. I was doing on-set hits for ESPN. There was a hit they wanted me to do on a live sports center where they were asking me about some prop bets, and then they asked me the prop, uh, what were the chances of Lenny Kravitz kissing Katy Perry on the mouth uh, during the halftime show? And obviously it was staged and it was a joke, and I started – you know, breaking down some ideas of, of, you know, you know, if he plays, uh, if she plays, I kiss the girl or whatever, like all this kind of stuff. And uh, then Lenny Kravitz walked onto the set and he said, no, 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 that's not what happened. And all of a sudden, you know, they went to Lenny and Lenny, they did an interview with Lenny. And as they were doing the interview with Lenny or as they went and zoomed in on Lenny, I just left the set because my segment was over. And for a lot of people that watched it, I guess it looked like I just vaporized. So Tony had been watching that in his hotel room with Matt Kelleher, his producer, and they had made a joke about how awkward it was that I had just vaporized. Now, we met that night for the first time at the ESPN party, and Tony said, oh, my God, you are that guy that vaporized. That must have been so awkward for you. And he started to try to make a big deal out of it. I, of course, didn't really care. Like, I was like, oh, it's kind of funny. I mean, Tony Kornheiser, he's insulting me. <laughs> and then Tony actually made a thing, of, 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 you know, a bit of an insulting thing. He said, hey, you look like you don't have very much money. I bet I could give you $50 to do something that he wanted me to do. And I just kind of laughed about it, and he walked away. And then I started talking to Matt Kelleher, and Matt asked me sort of about my story. And then he realized my backstory. And all of a sudden, he was like, oh, my God, I got to tell Tony. And then he told Tony. And it turned out Tony was actually a fan of, you know, bringing down the house and 21, the whole thing. So he felt like an idiot 
having, you know, sort of insulted me, came back to me sort of with, uh, you know, his tail between his legs and sort of kissed my ass for a little while. Um, I thought the whole thing was funny. He then sort of asked me to come on his show. And, you know, more or less, I've been going on that show every week during the football season since then. Love it. Love it. That is such a classic Tony move, and uh, that's one of the reasons yeah. I love him. I thought it was a pretty good story. Appreciate you sharing it here. Thank you for your time. And, no worries. Uh, man, we appreciate the information and uh, just the access. Thank you. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to have Take you care. on again uh, You know, later on in the season, maybe to talk, actually talk some numbers, talk some games and whatnot. But I, I kind of wanted to get a, a little bit of a backstory. Uh, but we do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on with us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this has been fantastic. All right. Awesome, awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. We appreciate you. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com, or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.